This is Rob Barnett. He's the CEO and founder of Omnivision Entertainment. Um, he's here today to basically talk with, to us about and with us uh, about marketing. Um, what I do, uh, so you know me, I'm Ben Zakheim, and I have not met all of you um, because I mostly deal with the graduating class, the third, the third years. Um, and what I'll be teaching you is uh, uh, marketing for creative people. Uh, you know how how can you get your uh, your work, your name. Uh, out in front of as many people as possible. And uh, while it's easier to, today than ever, it's also a, it's a tough uh, road to hoe. It's a maze, and you, and you have to kind of find your way through it. And so uh, Rob's here to help us uh, do that. Would, that. would that be a pretty good summary? That's a good intention. OK. <laughs> <laughs> it is, yeah. Right. And I, I guess the first thing I'll say is that um, you know, often if I go talk to large groups or if I'm in one of those dreaded panel discussions at conferences, I've noticed that the norm is that the people on my side of our conversation do 99.99% .99 of the talking and then say, don't worry, there's going to be room for questions at the end. And then there's usually room for one and they say, oh, we're so sorry, we're out of time. So I'm the opposite of that whole thought process, which is that, especially with this size, I, I think a conversation is always better because I'm old and I've done a lot of different things and I'll touch on some of them, but the things that might be more interesting aren't the things that I necessarily might want to talk about, but the things that you're interested in once you get a sense of uh, the different pathways that I've been on and, and, and some of the, the knowledge that I think I've got now about doing the two or three things that I've always been most interested in doing. I've done it in a lot of different uh, forms of media, but it always pretty much comes back to the same thing. I'm obsessed with talented people. I'm crazy about trying to somehow meet the most talented people that I can, and then find out if I'm lucky enough, how could I possibly Please join us, yeah. You know, how, how could I possibly um, not just meet somebody who's done some of the most incredible media or entertainment or art in the world, but perhaps talk them into this crazy idea of working with me um, so that I could uh, produce some original content with a great communicator, then figure out what the best pathway is to distribute that content. Is it radio? Is it television? Is it film? Is it the internet? Um, and, and then lastly, and the thing that Ben and I have been talking about as we've been getting to know each other over the last week, maybe the hardest parts are who's going to pay for it? And in this crowded world of confusion in media, how am I going to pick the best platform to get this work out there? And then, if I'm lucky enough to get someone to pay for it, how are me and the people that I'm working with going to be able to make enough promotional marketing noise on a consistent, regular basis so that the large amount of people that, sorry, I've just bashed the mic, the large amount of people that I hope could possibly find this work, how are they going to find it? How am I going to do that horribly embarrassing, terrible, awful thing called self-promotion? Which, you know, now I feel that our job as artists in the old world, the old world being the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, everything up until the minute YouTube was created, everything up until the minute that the internet became like oxygen, the artist's way was to make great art, bring it to one of a very few outlets, and that outlet would then do the rest, right? They'd get it seen, they'd give us money, they'd promote us. Now, every single one of you in this room feels the same way that major media stars in all forms feel. It's massive confusion. How am I going to get this out? 
YouTube now has approximately 100 hours of brand new video uploaded in the last 60 seconds. So if, and I'm not gonna waste time talking tonight too much about online video, which is what I do, because you guys don't do that. But I'm gonna try to take the experiences that I've got from that particular form of media and talk with you and answer questions that you've got about how the hell your work's gonna get seen when I'm just one of millions of people putting up a video on YouTube, how did I get that seen? Very, very difficult to do. Um, my path started in the oldest form of media, radio. Uh, I was obsessed with rock and roll ever since I was a little boy. And I played drums badly, so I thought if I can't become a musician, I wanted to be as close to the music as I could. So for me, I found in my first days of college, the college radio station, and that was, you know, the light from heaven went off in the sky and I said, that's it. That's what I wanna do. So I spent the first part of my career as a rock and roll radio guy, uh, moved around the country as you do when you have those jobs. You get fired a lot. Um, <laughs> the radio stations change format a lot. At the end of the 1980s, MTV was a place that played almost all music video uh, and was run by people like me who used to work in the radio business because it was programmed like a radio station with pictures. So I went there uh, thinking it was time for me to learn how to become a television producer, programmer. Uh, I love the word maker. <laughs> I wanted to become a maker. So I went there and had a 12 year run in television. I did a lot of different things, but I learned how to sit in a room all night long and say, honey, I'm almost home. I know it's one o'clock in the morning, but just one more edit. Uh, and, and I learned a, a, a lot uh, there from really great teachers about how to make television and uh, how to program television, meaning what are you gonna see it in the old way, eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, uh, and how to market, because for a long time MTV, when they were much cooler than they are today, became one of the sexiest brands in the world and, and one of the most powerful brands in the world that really spoke to an audience in the way that you all want to speak to an audience, authentically, without fear, with uh, as much reckless freedom as the United States of America is supposed to provide. Uh, and great talent, you know, just great talent came through those doors. So I, I learned a lot there. Um, I left and did some really interesting entrepreneurial projects for years that I'll skip in the interest of getting you to talk and ask questions. Uh, I went back to radio as an older guy, and this is about 10 years ago, I was the president of CBS Radio, which sounds really great, but I was also the unlucky jerk who had to replace Howard Stern when he decided to quit and go to satellite radio. That was, you know, I don't know, like losing everything, right? He was the biggest money maker in the entire corporation, and that was a crazy time. In 2006, YouTube was still a baby in diapers. YouTube was showing videos mostly of dogs and cats and babies doing silly things, shot by anyone. But the miracle of YouTube was that each of us could share a video with another person 
and not do what you have to do in the old days. In the old days, if I sent you a video, we, and it was three minutes long, we'd wait for the entire time of this class for the video to buffer. And then it still might not work, and we'd only get to watch some of it, and I'd say, oh, I'm sorry, but it was really cool. <laughs> the minute that they figured out the technology to allow us to share this particular medium instantly, I looked at it and made two predictions. The first prediction in 2006 was that this so-called user-generated content was not going to make money. It was going to create this behavior that was sexier than television, much more diverse, much more in your control than t television, which says, you must watch what I want you to watch. YouTube immediately changed that dynamic to, you will watch what you want to watch when you want to watch it. I looked at that and said, uh-oh, that's the beginning of the death of television in the old way. It certainly is the redefinition of the word television. And the pros, people who know how to make great shit, whether it's, I, how do you sign shit? Thank you. The, the people who know how to make the great shit, the talent, the artists, the executives, they're going to have to come into all this new media and make the better content that will make the most money. I also believed that if you were gonna stop watching television the way we all watch television, you were also on a DVR going to skip the commercials. I'll say it again. Uh-oh. Now this was eight or nine years ago. We're sitting here tonight only in about month five or month six, where all of that technology has finally created the pain that television and advertising feared the most. Television ratings as of tonight on most channels are 30% down. Now, that's only in the last six months. In the last seven, eight, nine years of all of our digital video consumption, television ratings were not down. So it just happened. happened? They're freaking out. What happened? Make happen. <laughs> uh, here's thing one. Okay. Hi, I'm between the ages of 17 and I'm out of college, but mom and dad or mom and or dad still let me live there. I'm 26. I'm out on my own now. Am I going to pay $189 a month to a cable company to watch hundreds of channels I have absolutely no interest in watching? Never. So that's called a cord never. I'm 55 years old. Eight years ago, my wife and I looked at each other. We were about to have little twin babies and we just said, why don't we just cut the cord? I don't watch sports. We have Netflix, we have Amazon, we have YouTube, I don't care. So every year when the Oscars happen, we check into a hotel. <laughs> and it's very romantic, and the kids come. And we watch the Oscars, but I'm not joking. I've lived without television for eight years, and I lived most of my life with it. So yeah. that happens. You can use Periscope, you know. That's the thing that you can actually see people streaming and live that. TV on their Twitter feed. And, yeah. But the last thing that happened, as we said a few minutes ago, and this is 
all of your jobs in this room will get off a of video in three more minutes and talk about what you want to talk about. All of your jobs are the same. We want to be artists that make great work. We want to have a career where we get to, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, do this full time and be paid to do it and love doing it and have it seen by an amount of people that will allow us to continue to live as artists. Is that fair to say? That's what we'd like to do. I, I can work at Chipotle, but I'd rather be paid to create art. I'd rather do that. So it's gotten, as you said, way harder for everyone. But because it's so hard for the power brokers, because it's so hard for the people you think are in charge of granting you a career, because they're so confused about all this new media, you have it a hundred times better than people had it 10 years ago when everything was certain, they knew how to control it, they did control it, they were the gatekeepers, and they got to decide whether or not you get to have a career. Now they don't, because you can have a career yourself, thank you, without asking anyone's permission. And I hope we get to talk a little bit more about how by answering your questions. I'll show you just for context, two minutes and 30 seconds of what we do, but I really, don't think it's useful to do more than two minutes of it because you guys don't do this. But it is an example of a guy who for the first time ever said, what if I go out there as an artist and try to do my own thing without asking anyone's permission? And the thing I do want to talk to you all about, convincing other talented people that I have a good vision and you should work with me and let's make something together that's really great that will give you access to an audience through technology immediately that has the chance to be seen by as many people as see television and maybe in addition to the artistic freedom I'm giving you, the artists, we can make money and if we can make some money I promise I'll share it so I can't sit here and say that I'm rich, because Joan knows I'm far from it, but I have been able to do this for technically nine years without dying yet. So I'll show, I'll show you what we do. Whoops. But with so much content out there, if you're creating that very content, how do you stand out? It's always been about talent. That's true. Hi, I'm Adam Carolla. I'm David Cross. I'm Eugene Merman. I'm John Benjamin. I'm John Glazer. I'm Kurt Brownover. My name is Reggie Watts. This is Wyatt Snack. Look, I get it. Go tell it on the mountain. How long must I be in this purgatory? You really think you're ready to get back into a bathing suit? Rob is kind of a jerk. Excuse me? With all apologies to Pink, Maya, Little Kim, and Christina Aguilera, voulez-vous coucher avec moi ce soir? Let's do some grown-up Photoshop. Because now I have your phone. Detect you. Let's go to the scrapbook. You know what this party needs? Live internet comedy show on the internet. Three-fourths of the Gargi Brothers, where's Andrew? In the studio! So, where's the crew and... and Don't worry that... about the crew, you can just focus on me. So, no cameras? There are definitely cameras. Interacting with real people and engaging socially with, with, with people. And here we have some twins, Emma and Olivia. You sure they're not clones? <laughs> they could be.
ultimate sandwich. I should have warned you that it's impossible to sign what we call a sizzle reel. <laughs> but it's funny because in, in, in so much of what uh, happens these days, and Ben and I have talked a lot about this, in order to get any work out there, seen, supported, paid for, and I'll use this word, started, the norm has become make a sizzle reel, as people call that, for about maybe two minutes to try to show examples of a world that you want to create for someone rather than having that first ever meeting where you go in the room just naked talking, pitching, or pitching on paper. It's very hard. So again, I'm speaking only about video, but... Uh, I think it works across any visual might, medium. Yeah. I mean, if you take, if you walk into a place that you're looking to get something, you have to show something or give something. And I don't, if, you, if you leave it up to their imaginations, well, they're, they're not going to get it as much. If you show them something specific, yeah. they can say, oh, well, I really like this. And we also talked about kind of a ripple in that as far as, you know, taking work that you have and wanting to find somebody to finance it or publish it or produce it. Um, I mean, how do you get people who see something that they like to take that extra step? I mean, that's, you're the person who sits on the other side of that desk sometimes. So yeah. I, mean, I guess some advice, my actual advice for me, my question to you as a writer, <laughs> right, yeah. is how would I do that? I think three things have to happen <clears throat> in every experience where you're walking into a room needing the support of someone who either has the money you need, the distribution you need, the promotion that you need, if those are three of the biggest needs. I think, and I came from a big pitch meeting straight here from Brooklyn today, I think that the first thing that has to happen every time you sit down with someone who's in a position to help your career is that the number one most important thing, regardless of what art you're in, is you. You have to get over this horrible, awful, embarrassing fear that I had for so long called sell yourself. I hated the idea. I just thought, can't they just look at my work and judge that? No, it's really about a human connection. And I sit there in the room and go, this guy's legit. I like him. He seems like he's real. He's talking to me. I'm engaged. I'm listening. He's making eye contact with me. He's passionate about what he is saying. He's honest about what he knows. He's honest about what he doesn't know. He's honest about what he needs. He's open to hearing how I might be able to add. All of those things are job one. Form a real connection with that person. The second thing that has to happen is that the person's gotta be interested in the idea that you're bringing. The only way that that has a chance of happening, and I'm a college dropout and I hated doing homework, but as a business person and as an entrepreneur, I do an insane amount of homework every single time. Because most of the people that have come in and met me for, say, a job at MTV, come in with their resume, and this is the college I went to, and boy, I really like music, and I would love to work here, and it's clear that they haven't sat in a room painfully for at least seven or eight days and watched nonstop MTV enough to be able to speak to it with clarity. And have opinions about and it. And have opinions and, yeah, about yeah. it or ask questions about it. It's just, hi, take me, fly me, hire me, love me, but not 
what about what we do? I would say at my company, have you seen Grace? Like you, I think, noticed that you noticed her, right? I think you did. Someone did. I, Grace is one of the biggest stars on the internet, and she did that with five or six years of unbelievable hard work, working for us every single day. But people would come in and like, I'd say, well, have you seen Grace? And they'd say, who? Like, oh, come yeah. on, you're done. So one is a real connection. The second is do your homework and really bring an idea to that company, that person, that's something that you know from the homework is really a part of what they're trying to do. And then if it's commercial, answer the question, how is it gonna make money? And now answer the fourth question, the one that says we're not allowed to sleep more than three or four hours a night because we live on social media. We used to be able to just do the art and sleep a little more and have a little more fun in all of its forms. Now we're allowed to do all those things, but only if we're on social media. Sharing it. Sharing it. <laughs> As we do it. All day long. I mean, do, how many people, and be honest, please be honest and be immediate when I ask you this question. Put your hand right up if you know her. 10 out of 10 people usually don't. Is there anyone in this room who knows Amanda Palmer? Wow, I fucking love you guys. That never happens, that never happens. So I'm working with Amanda now, and I met Amanda seven or eight years ago just as a music fan. I can't believe you know her, I'm so happy. I'm gonna cry. Does anyone know what happened to Amanda in the last two days? I'll tell you later. So, She's the most inspiring person I've ever met in social media, as is her husband, Neil Gaiman. They're artists, they're lovers, they're married, they're going to have a child, their first child in September. But if you have a lousy 100 followers on Twitter and you ask them a question at two o'clock in the morning, but not this week where they just lost their best friend. They'll answer you at two o'clock in the morning. And then if they tell you that they're performing in New York tomorrow night at eight o'clock, those of us who love the two of them will go and we'll be there. And if they say it's $5, we'll pay that. And if they say it's $10, we'll pay that. And they're artistically free, doing exactly what they want to do, but communicating 20 hours a day with every single person that has said, I care, I appreciate you, I'm interested in you, I have a question, I need help. You know, she wrote this book called The Art of Asking. And I didn't know her that well last fall when the book came out, but it came out on a Tuesday. That Saturday, I was in LA getting ready to fly home. Excuse me, it was 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning in LA. So I knew that it was seven or eight o'clock in the morning in Boston where Amanda lives. And I'd only met her backstage once or twice. I don't know her at this point. So I take the book, I buy it in the airport and I put it here on the windowsill where you can see a plane in the background. I take a picture and I caption it, this is how I will spend Saturday flying home, hashtag Amanda Palmer. I upload it to Twitter. 1001, 1002, 1003, retweet. Yay, Rob, Amanda. I don't know her at this point. And I couldn't believe it. I was like, I still get tingles when I tell the story. That was Saturday. The following Tuesday, the seventh day of the book's release, it came out at number seven on the New York Times bestseller list because that's what she's trying to teach all of us in this room, to be an artist in 2015. That's, and I said that I'm gonna work for her. I wanna learn that. I have to learn that. Um, does anyone in the room know who Harry Shearer is? 
usually one, two. So Harry, and it's unclear whether it's over or not, but in every single episode of The Simpsons, he's about 30 of the voices. He's now saying, screw you, I'm out of here, I'm quitting, because they don't pay him enough. But maybe he's not, maybe he is. He has a radio show every weekend for the last 30 years on NPR called Le Show. I think it's on WNYC here. He was on Saturday Night Live for years. He writes a book every year or two. He's in every single Chris Guest movie, including Spinal Tap. He's the bass player. He, he's got 15 other jobs. I hired him to work for my company doing original online video. Amanda's 39, Harry's 71, Harry lives on Twitter because at 71 years old, and he's been in show business since he was seven, he realizes now that if he's going to write a book or write an article or draw a picture or do a movie or record an album and you care and you told him you care, then he has to respond to you in real life on the internet. Amanda does it in real life. He'll, he'll do it, you know, all night long. And Grace, who's now 20-something, has been doing this since she was 18. So I guess I want to turn it over to you guys for questions, but I think that if, if I can make that assumption I made earlier, that we want to work as artists, we want to find enough money to let us work as artists Full time, thank you. And we need to build an audience and find supporters, then we're all in the same business, you know, even though you're not making wacky comedy videos on the internet, you know. I think it's a great question. It is. It's a really great question. What I love about every single outlet that we now have at our disposal, all media outlets that we can access, whether it's uh, your own blog, your own newsletter, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, which believe it or not is starting to have technology that's better than many of them, even though you don't think about it as an artist. Wow, can you find all the business people in the world you ever wanted right there. It's great. It's smarter than many of the others. Facebook, which sucked two years ago, is now a thousand times better as a place where people are discovering content and video. But in every single one of these outlets, you have the opportunity to go home tonight and completely represent. Hard to sign the way I'm trying to say it, but I love that way of pronouncing that word. You can represent yourself every day of the week in the way that you want to represent yourself to the people you're trying to touch. So I think that depending on who you're trying to reach, there's a reason to want to show depth, it's hard to say that word always, depth and breadth, and then there's other times a reason to show one thing, because I certainly know, and we could talk all night long about writing emails, I'm kind of crazy about it, you know, like, I hate people who don't respond, so I'm always obsessing over what am I gonna say, how briefly can I say it, how are they gonna effing respond. You know, less is always more, and you have to be so succinct. So sometimes, if you have something new that you're really proud of, and you look back at your older work, like I have videos on this site that I probably should take down, because they suck it might be a good idea to constantly control your artistic output based on the goal that you've got. And then the other thing that we should spend time talking about tonight, I'll just use this word, 
connections, right? You gotta constantly find better connections. That guy knows someone who I need to meet that might actually be the person that's finally gonna accept my work and let me do it for, you know, cash money. Well now, that contact to me, I just came from, this is, uh, I'm gonna be out on the internet so I won't say the company. I just came from a really big pitch meeting, okay? And I'm working with Amanda. But we tailored this pitch to this particular company that we were meeting knowing that in every situation where I need somebody to say they wanna work with me, half of that conversation is what I want the project to be and if I need them, the other half is what they want the project to be. So they said, well, would Amanda do this, this, and this? I said, I don't know, but I'll ask her. You know, instead of no, or this is the way we're doing the project. So I hope I'm getting to some of your question, but you know, if I were you, I'd be thinking at any given moment, I know everyone can see this, but who are the people I'm really focused on that I want to see it right now. Let me make sure that the stuff that's up there is the stuff that, as best as I know, they'll be interested in. Yeah. And one other thing I want to say is that um, I think in the beginning of any career path now, if, it's, if this is the beginning, if I'm someone who's obsessed with uh, wood flooring, and that's my path, then my Instagram should mostly be that. I don't think it should be this amazing piece of pecan pie that I had this weekend because I'm obsessed with it. I'm off message because I'm trying to get a career going and yes, I love pecan pie, but nobody know, not enough people know who I am yet and are helping me get my career started for me to be taking stupid pictures of the stupid food that I'm eating because that's what people do on the internet. I need a friggin' job and I'm the wood flooring guy. So I should be that on social media, appropriate to the platform, meaning I'll tweet differently than I'll Instagram and I'll Facebook differently, but if I really need to get my career going, why am I putting nonsense up? Why not say, I'm your floor guy, you know? And be that person, branding yourself constantly, because the person you go meet with, hopefully, is gonna stalk you, and look at you and go, what's our deal, you know? So why would they see stuff that's like, again, of no interest to what you're trying to do unless you have a fake name for, you know, that's a good reason to have fake names, it is. You know, if you really want, I love posting crap about my life, because it's just fun, I love it, it's fun. It's my drug. But if I really needed to establish myself in my career, I probably would not do it. I would just probably go, comedy, videos, remember? Funny stuff, ha ha, I'm that guy, I'm the funny guy, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, any other questions? I have one, okay, go ahead. Yeah, it's one of the best accidents of my life. Joan, I promised Joan I wouldn't tell seven hour stories, so I'll try to do the quick one. When I started, I needed to come up with a brand. I needed, to me, everything, and we just touched on this a minute ago, everything is brand. It's like, get people to sort of see you in a certain way. So coming up with the name was the hardest thing, my damn channel. It said a lot of what I wanted to say, which is television, old, new TV, all of us, you know. Um, so I needed branding people, and I needed a logo, and I needed all those things that I don't know how to do that you guys know how to do. So how do you get a logo? Someone said, look at the Webby Award winners. And I looked at this list of all these people that had done amazing web design. And I found these crazy web design guys that uh, presented themselves with this funny brand name. They called themselves Big Fat Brain. And they created a really twisted site where these two guys were wearing lab coats and they did it in black and white 
like it was an old 50s movie. And I just was tripped out by their originality. And I contacted them and said, where are you, New York? No. LA? No. Boston? No. San Francisco? We started playing this game. And I go, all right, I give up. Where are you? And they go, Covington, Kentucky. And I go, you're not in Covington, Kentucky. You're way too close. No, we're there. So one thing leads to another. I hire them as my graphic designers, my branding guys. And they say, we want to make videos. And I go, so does everyone. But we have stars making videos. Sorry. And they go, no, trust us. We can make really funny stuff. And they started doing all this experimental stuff. And one day, they made the first episode of that. And I nearly died. I mean, it's like, <laughs> because, because the hardest thing that any of us can do we're all influenced by the art that we love and the artists that we love. We are. It's impossible, almost impossible, to be original all these years later when we've all seen some of the greatest talent in popular culture. So I always am looking for something that I feel like I haven't seen before, or at least something that's taking, in this case, a form that does exist a tutorial video on the internet. But as Barbara said, like the guy's inner life is unraveling. It's really dark. It's really twisted. It's funny as hell. And just take something that does exist, but put your bend on it, you know? And then, it, and then back in the days when the internet was in diapers, every time we put a video up, it had millions of views. I mean, it was, there wasn't that much good stuff out, you know? So yeah, I love those two men. And they're one vowel away from South Park. So instead of being Matt and Trey, their names happen to be Matt and Troy, which I thought was really cute. <laughs> they're great, yeah. No, I was gonna go there next. So you're Alex, right? Yep. Um, this, is, this is the thing. There's, let's lay out the only ways to get paid. I'll try to think, I'll try to remember all of them. Way one, don't be an individual person all alone trying to do it. Take your talent to a company that has resources and some money and do it for them, through them, with them. You know, join a company. If like me, you'd prefer to be an individual or an independent, because companies usually suck, um, then advertising is one way. But I think I touched on this before. I mean, how often are you not going to take the opportunity to skip an ad? You're usually going to skip those. So I think that model is in trouble. Third way. Crowdfunding, which up until now, with Kickstarter, Indiegogo, and all the rest, has been based mainly on a per project mindset. What's great that you know about Patreon, you guys, I love this room. Like, most people don't know about Amanda, and nobody knows about Patreon. Patreon is an answer, a new answer, to the Kickstarter Indiegogo problem. Like Grace, who works for me, she went and did a Kickstarter. This is now a famous Hollywood movie story. They crowdfunded a movie that only cost $500,000 to make. Her two best friends on the internet are Hannah Hart, who does My Drunk Kitchen, and Mamre Hart, who does you deserve a drink, because they like to drink. So they crowdfund a movie for $500,000. The movie's now made millions of dollars. But Grace said to me at the time, I'm worried about this, because once I go to the well, and please, all my friends, come on, can you give me $5? Please, can you give me, mom, you know, I've gone to the well. Well, what if I want to do something else in a year? And I, I, again, I have to beg you, like it's hard. Patreon says, all you guys love me, I love you. Can you come in for like maybe a buck a month? Just $12 a year. All right, 
come on, $5 a month, 60 bucks. If Kickstarter says I'll fund a thing, and Amanda and I love this word, Patreon says I will fund all of your things, but this is where they're very smart. You can cap it, because what if you give me five bucks a month and I make a hundred things a month? That kind of, you can't. You're not going to do that. So you can cap it at five bucks a month, or maybe if I'm really putting out great stuff, 10 bucks a month. You can cancel in five seconds at any time. But this is really interesting now, because let's call this the subscription model, right? Which is what Amazon's doing and Netflix is doing. I think there's a lot to be said for this. And the only way that you can successfully get there, wherever there is for you, meaning how much do you need, is back to living on social media, back to always creating great art, back to always forming real relationships with the people one at a time who care about you, and then helping their friends do what they want to do by the thing that Ben and I have been talking about like nuts for the last week. Collab, 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 collab. You gotta collab. You can't just do your thing and hope that everybody's gonna promote it. You gotta help somebody else do their thing and cross promote it. And I forget that all the time. When I first signed Grace, you know, I was like, I'm paying you all this money every year, you work for me. And then all of a sudden, late at night, I saw her on somebody else's YouTube channel. And like an old man, I got really mad. It's like, that's illegal. You can't do that. And somebody much smarter than me, 30 years younger than me, sat me down and said, you're an idiot. The person she's collabing with has millions of subscribers. It's good for us. It's going to get her work known. It's going to get her known. Let all of that freedom happen. Share all of this art with others who have a larger audience. And you'll get there. And then you'll help them. And then you'll help somebody else. It's so punk. You know, it is. It's so punk, but it, you know. So Patreon, you guys should just find a few people, support them for a buck a month. For $12 a year, pick somebody so you can learn how Patreon works, right? Commit tonight to find somebody, and you'll make their day. My friend Jesse is a great filmmaker and editor. Um, you know, I... I Gave him five bucks a month, you know, or I think I gave you more, Jesse. You, you know I did. But I can't say how much because then everyone. But, you know, it meant so much because now uh, you're building on that, right? A friend of mine launched a card game on Kickstarter today. And, uh, yeah, find people. And, you know, 12 bucks a year, 60 bucks a year to help another artist is going to give you all that education you know, about how that particular system of crowdfunding or subscription works to, to help you get paid by people who really care about you, in addition to working for some stupid company. I, just, I love the idea of Patreon, and it is an idea in my head. I haven't used it yet, but, but it, well, I work in many genres. I work in science fiction, I work in middle grade, and I think your question earlier about, like, I have different work for different people, you know, I might like the work I did over here, and I like the work over here, but how do you present it? Well, it seems to me like Patreon is possibly kind of your hub, kind of a place where you can be the brand. You can be the person who does all that stuff, and you can gather people there to maybe make some money, no matter what you do, whether you do a comic book about, you know, romance comic book or science fiction comic book, whatever it is, it's all about you and all the things that you do, which is, is, a, is a real, that's a big step up from anything else I've heard of. Mm. You just made me think of something else, too. I've never liked the idea. I just keep using Chipotle for some reason. <laughs> I, I've never, I like Chipotle. I'm not burned down on it yet. Yeah. But yeah. I, I keep, I've never liked the idea of saying, I want to be this artist. And in order to support myself, I'm going to take a shit job because I have to. I've never done that. But... 
the compromise I have made and still make today is I say that there's the work that I know my heart wants to do in my field. Then, as an artist, there's the work that I'm capable of doing in my field. But let's just say it's way more commercial than I might want to do. I better do that in addition to doing the art of my heart or else the whole thing melts down and I am working at Chipotle. So it's a balance between saying, somebody wants me to do this thing that I would never on my own create from my heart, but I have skills and I can do this for them. And it's not like I'm in some other world digging ditches. I'm using my skills but I'm using my skills for something that somebody else needs me to do and they will pay me for it in addition to the art of my heart which might not pay me for a while until the god and goddesses of art embrace me more and let me get paid what I deserve to get paid. You know, that might not happen quick enough. So I hope I'm explaining that in a way that makes sense, but I think about that all the time. It's like, you know, John Lennon used to talk about songwriting and what he called craftsmanship, you know, and he said, I can craft a hit, but it might not be that song he really wanted to do, you know, and there's two different kinds of songs, right? One is popular and makes a lot of money and the other has Yoko on it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> What's in his heart? That was sharp. That was sharp. So it, um, the art of asking, that, that, that seems to be part of the, what we're talking about here, right? I mean, or at least uh, Amanda Palmer's book, Art of Asking, is that what attracted you to her? Was it that book in particular? Was it the idea on the art of asking? And maybe you can talk, tell us a little bit about what the art of asking is. Well, it's worth a read for a couple of bucks. I mean, I, 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 I think there's a lot of things that she's trying to share about how to ask for help. She talks a lot about shame. You know, this feeling of you don't like yourself if you feel like you're begging people for help. It's really hard. It's a, it's a step to get over that. Um, but she also talks about value and the fact that we woke up someday in our lives, all of us in this room, and decided we're artists. Sorry. You know? <laughs> Sorry, mom. Like, Dad. I'm not a brain surgeon. I'm not a train conductor. I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a doctor. I'm none of those things. I'm creating art. And the question that she asks all the time, and she's taken a lot of grief, a lot of grief over asking for money and being given money. And then people said, wait a minute, you didn't share it all with the musicians and you didn't pay everyone and what the hell, you're stealing? And you know, the question, that, and I'm just paraphrasing, I can never speak for her, I can just speak for myself. Sure. But you know, she's asked questions like, well, why is it that, you know, other people in society um, are paid mazillions of dollars, but if an artist goes out and raises a measly million dollars, they're called a criminal. Like, what, what is that? And, and, and if they're a woman, they're attacked even more. Why is that? Why? Because don't we need it? Isn't the world sad enough that it needs all of us in this room to make it just a little less sad? And what's that worth compared to what we pay a doctor, a lawyer, a, a insert name of other jobs that I'm not capable of ever doing? So there's a lot in there um, a, about asking, giving, and sharing help with people that um, need each other um, in order to I think there's a myth. I mean, uh, you know, I can call myself an entrepreneur for the last nine years, 
but I think there's a myth that we're all somehow supposed to somehow get from where we are to greatest, most famous artist in the world alone or with one or two people as opposed to um, going out and really getting the people that fill in all the holes and gaps that you're missing in order to get there. Why would you know how to be a social media expert? Why would you know how to be a, 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 a accountant? I certainly don't. Um, you know, I have a company. How do you pay for people's health care? I don't know. But I had to go find people who did. And, and so at the beginning of a career, I think you have to say to people that you love, trust, and respect, I need help. I need this, this, and this. Uh, do you know anything about PR? Because I don't. I need someone to help me do that. Do you have any money? No. But will you help me with X amount of hours this, each week for this many weeks? I swear, if I can sell this and get this thing sold, I will give you this much. Are you in? I just need this many hours a week. And I think we all have to ask that of each other at the beginning to form enough of an audience that gives us the hope of finding cash. Yeah, and, and that's what I love about the, the, that whole idea. It's not just the art, I'm using uh, uh, Amanda's terminology, but it's not just the art of asking for money. It's the art of asking for help in building your art. Awareness. Help, aware, help building <laughs> awareness. And uh, it could be, you know, Nathan drew my cover for Camelot Kids. That was an amazing experience. I know I work well with him. He does fantastic work. He's got a massive network, so who knows how many sales that led to. Mm -hmm. I won't actually tell him. But it was all, it was all um, you know, on the up and up, and we had a great time with it. But, you know, his network was added to mine. Mine can be added to his whenever he wants. So it becomes not just an art, but not just asking for money, but asking for talent and offering your own as well. So being available to the people around you. And that, that's what I get from our discussions that we've had in the last week. So. Yeah, there, there is a need to, um, I mean, again, I'll talk about my buddy who launched a Kickstarter yesterday. I called a mutual friend this morning. I said, did he call you yet? And he said, yes, you know, because there's just no way to kickstart the Kickstarter without his five or ten closest friends going, okay, I'm in, let's go. You got to, you got to, you know. You got to, you got to, you got to, you know. And then if they know that you're going to be there for them on whatever it is that you're going to come back with, you know. I saw a guy a couple nights ago, I went to a salon. Uh -oh. And the guy got up at the, I don't like the sound of that. salon <laughs> and talked about givers, takers, and then the third one, which of course is the best one, which is, I forget what he called it, I'll have to look it up and tell you. But it, it's interesting, you know, you just, you, you want an exchange of help and know that if, if you're going to be there for your friends, that they're going to be there too, because this shit is hard. Yeah. It's so hard to make enough noise to get to level two, level three, level four. Yeah. And often friends will have the answers to your questions, like how am I gonna make money on this web comic? Well, a friend of a friend of mine just made it on Patreon, or they just made it through a newsletter where they give exclusive web comics in the newsletter for a dollar a month. I mean, there's just all of these ways that other people can help. And when we're in our own zone and we're creating and we're the auteurs, right, that it's hard to, it's hard to reach out. Also, where depression sneaks in. <laughs> <laughs> that whole thing. No, it's not good to be too isolated, you know. You gotta share your work. Yeah. So for for and correct me if I don't restate the question because I realize that since there's video we're gonna share and you guys aren't mic'd, there's two topics to talk about. One is the balance of all of your social media posts being promotional about your work versus promotional about other things, right? Or non-promotional. That's one question, right? Am I capturing yeah. it? 
And then the second question, which of course is brutal and honest and scary as hell, is will there ever be a life-work balance? Um, I'll start with the life-work balance and say that I definitely have found that there's a new happy. For me, the happy is you've got to pick times like right now where you're not on the device and you're talking to real people. I've started a new joke. Uh, sometimes if somebody tweets something towards me directly, I call them on the phone. And they're always shocked. They're like, especially if it's at midnight or 8 o'clock in the morning, and I'll say, what's up? And they'll go, what? Like they're naked, you know, <laughs> like probably are naked. But, you know, I think you've got to increase. As we've all increased the amount of this typing, you have to increase the amount of this, talking, and pick up the phone, and talk to people more. And, you know, Joan and I are gonna go out to dinner tonight. We're not gonna be on the phone. The first time I took Amanda out for a business lunch to talk about working together, I was so honored for all the amount of minutes that Amanda Palmer was not on the phone. It shocked me, because I was like, wow, she's talking to me, you know? And, and in a relationship, let's talk about a love relationship, you know how it is when the person looks at you in bed and says, come on. I mean, it's, I think it's important to start looking for more times when you're not on the device, okay? But now having said that, you're an artist. You better also be on the device a lot getting to your first question, which is how much, how often, and this god-awful feeling of how self-promotional I think that, I'll go back to the thing we discussed earlier tonight. I just picked this beautiful wood floor and say, if that's my art, if that's where I'm mostly focused, I'm the wood floor guy, it doesn't always have to be about my beautiful wood floors, but it should more often than not stay on topic because I'm trying to build a career. I'm trying to get people to see that I don't just do 18 different things, that's gonna be hard. I mean, you could start to market yourself tonight as 18 different kinds of artists and 18 different mediums, but good luck with that, you know? I think if you pick a lane or two to swim in, then swim in that lane, be self-promotional, but be self-promotional in an interesting way. Don't suck at it, and guess how you learn? The numbers are right there. Go post something at 10 o'clock tonight, take a risk, and do something unusual in the way you posted it, and then see how it respond, how the response is. And if the response sucks, that was a failure. And by the way, back to your question earlier, delete it, because it sucked. But then tomorrow, take another risk, and say, I'm gonna talk about this in a totally different way. I'm inspired to try to reach people, you know? And oh my God, look at my number. And they're instant, they're immediate. And people are having fun and they're talking about it. Don't take that one down. Copy it in, and tomorrow you start finding that voice that says people that know, are following me like that voice. When I do it that way, the numbers are up. Don't, you know, stay there. It's like, it's like being a stand-up comic. Comic. I think that's the hardest thing in the world to do. You know, they're at clubs tonight, you know, for months and months and months before they're ever on tour or on television testing. In social media, you can do it every minute of your crazy life. And, and the numbers are your audience. They, they, they tell you. How self-promotional am I being? A little too self-promotional. Your numbers suck. Like your numbers aren't going. First thing I did when I talked to him on the phone is, is I started saying, let me look at him. So I looked at him on Twitter. I was like, oh, he's got 3,000 something. You know, he's, he's the guy. But I have, a, I have a funny story <laughs> about that though because I was you know, approaching this number and I love Twitter. I'm, so it's not just a thing that I use on occasion. I love it. I, I get it. I sell books through it. Um, but I had this very busy week this week. So I did a very a big no-no from a certain point of view. I posted ahead of time and I did just a bunch of posts and you know you're allowed to do it programmed it yeah I programmed them ahead of time scheduled them ahead of time and we can talk about tools to use that that are good and ones that are bad 
Um, but I made the mistake of doing most of them promotional. And I lost 20 followers just in the last few days because it's just promotion, promotion, promotion. That was just a bad call on my part. But I can see the numbers. It's like that shows me, and in my particular balance is 80-20, like I try to do 80% other people's stuff, um, you know, uh, curating things, and then 20% mine. Probably ends up being 60-40 and um, 40 being me. Um, so yeah, it does depend. And it's all, isn't it also a matter of which social network you choose? Like you can't, you don't, I mean, signing up for everything kind of seems like a lost cause. Pinterest and Instagram and Tumblr and Facebook and Twitter, I mean, is how, how would you advise as far as like what to choose or just go for everything, go wide? Well, I, I do think they each have their own appeals and their own negs. Um, I saw somebody yesterday uh, talk about Instagram and this person said, at first, the most beautiful picture seemed to be the way we all wanted to communicate with each other. What was the most beautific thought I could share with you? This person said, if you want more people to follow you, then show more people in your life, not just trees and seascapes. You know? And that was interesting. So I, I don't know, I think like we were saying a minute ago, there's a lot of trial and error with, with all of these uh, platforms. Certainly on Twitter, the people who are communicating with each other more than posting as themselves are the people who have the largest followings. It's a true two-way communication, and I suck at it. I'm getting better after four I years. I suck at it, yeah, you know? I'm always just trying to it's hard. say, here's this thing I'm doing, I want you to know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not as effective, you know? Um, Facebook, as we said earlier, a minute ago, wow, did they increase their ability to transmit video in a way that now uh, you know, sometimes in a large room we'll do a show of hands and say, how many people are discovering more video on face? Before you complete the word Facebook, every yeah, hand goes up. So. It's amazing what they've done. You know, they're becoming a video discovery platform. Um, by the way, did anybody see some forced ads on Twitter in the last few days? I did. More. Like, the, something's up. <laughs> you know, they're changing. So, you know, it's all trial and error. You have to just you have to experiment, and like we were saying a minute ago, you learn so fast when you're, you know, it's like, you know, it's sports, right? You're like getting hits, you're striking out. You know. Yeah, you're watching you those know. stats. Those are real numbers, yeah, right? In real television people. and radio, it was always a percentage of the population of the United States of America. This is it, you know, these are, bless you, these are your numbers, you know? They, they, they tell you right away if you're, communicating in a way that's of interest to the people that, that care about you. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, but that, the idea of tweaking your voice, I actually just realized I've been on Twitter since 2007, so the first year it was out. Very early, yeah. Yeah, very early. I didn't do anything with it until I left corporate life and decided to become a writer for a living, and then I focused on it. And I found that the party chatter, it's a, the, it's, it, it plays to what I enjoy the most. I get to craft a very quick little message and make it look all pretty, and it's like a haiku. I get to send it out there and see, and, and I get to respond to people. Um, so that kind of thing is really, um, a, it's, a, it's appealing to me. So I think that to, to hone in on the social network that kind of speaks to you, that is the most comfortable for you, because there's so much uncomfortable about being an artist. There's so much uncomfortable about being a mar marketing your stuff. Why should you struggle with the platform you're on? I mean, screw that. There's no, there's, there's just, there's no reason. It's not, not going to bring any good from it. You might know somebody who's really good on that platform, right? And they, they, you collaborate or you leverage that connection, and they can help you out on their platform. But I think it is a matter of, you know, in my own personal experience, it's been a matter of finding that right platform and sticking with it and getting to know it so well that you can see the movement of numbers and see the conversation starting and respond in, in, in a very genuine way, in a way that is true to who you are, not like, ah, shit, what do these people want to hear, you know? So, yeah. Are there any other questions? 
All right. Well, Rob, thank you so much thank for you. joining us tonight. <laughs>